I think most of us forget how important the skin is. Obviously, the largest organ in the body serves more than just an aesthetic role, but obviously youthful skin also provides a better barrier. And so, you know, that's why we talk about using sunscreen and stimulating collagen and all of these different things because skin is so incredibly important. You know, and the reason why I brought, I, I selected some of these studies is because I think that we could target topical therapies to some of these things and that's where skincare is going to go. When you see a company like L'Oreal do a combined study with PhDs, you know there's something behind it, Absolutely. right? And so it's it's better for us as skincare research to keep our finger on the pulse to see where potentials are going to go. Agreed. So I thought that maybe I would lead us with a, a study that really has to do with the type of bacteria on the skin. We call it a microbiome and it's links to aging. I'll just read you a, a quick summary. Recent findings have identified a potential new link to signs of skin aging, the skin microbiome, the collection of microorganisms that inhabits our skin. And it's interesting, and I'll go into the study and its outcomes and things like that, but it's interesting because we always look at, look at the effects of aging and external factors like UV skin exposure, you know, that's all well documented. And people, as, as we age, we spend more time in the sun, the skin tends to become drier, more wrinkled, right? But there are other multiple things at play that we may be able to control. And two of the studies that we picked out today, one you're going to kind of go into, um, show some of those things that we could potentially control the outcome. All right. This is a uh, collaborative study that was carried out by researchers at the Center for Microbiome Innovation, CMI, at the University of California, San Diego, and cool. ding, 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 L'Oreal Research and Innovation. Wow. Okay. okay. And to the best of the team's knowledge, uh, this study was the first to isolate microbiomes associated specifically with signs of skin aging and skin health rather than chronologic age. So this becomes very important. And they used, uh, you know, I won't go into it, they used some fairly uh, sophisticated data analysis and um, the way that they measure transepidermal water loss and the type of microbiome. And here's ultimately, out of they had a study using 650 females age 18 to 70. Okay. All we know is that as we age, and the same thing happens in the gut, is that the, we, we lose some of the, the, the healthy microbiome in our gut, our skin. And what they found is that it leads to further wrinkling. And so now, these, this is an associative study. This is not where they added bacteria to people's face to see if it reduced these lines. Sure. So again, you know, there's a difference between an epidemiological study where they notice an association versus a causal study or causation. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not planting bacteria on the face. But it does beg the question, what happens if we do that? So again, we already know that in yes. the gut, you take a micro or a, a probiotic and it can help gut health. Absolutely. So the, what they're claiming here is that we could potentially isolate the correct microbiome. You place that on the skin. Now imagine you've got topical skincare that contains this healthy microbiome, and now your skin could potentially be protected or look younger. And when you see that positive association, so again, the more diverse bacteria were on the skin, the idea is that you have less lateral cantal lines or crow's feet. Crow's feet, sure the less diverse or you have less of that bacteria. So let's say, you know, you're, you originally start off with 10 really important bacteria and now you only have two. That is associated with an increase in transepidermal water loss. That is one of the key issues in crepey skin, dry skin, because we lose the intercellular connection uh, and you have the evaporative losses of skin and that increase, you're, you're no longer able to hold on to the necessary water. 
you know, we already know that we lose uh, some of the extracellular matrix and hyaluronic acid, uh, which hangs onto uh, inordinate amounts of water in the skin. Mm -hmm. And when you lose that, so, you know, again, this is going to be multifactorial. We know that there's cellular dysfunction. We lose some of the main components inside the dermis of the skin. But can it be that we could help it along by placing the right, you know, uh, biology uh, meaning the right bacteria on our skin. So, so diversity matters. Yes, diversity in matters. every aspect in of the world. But, that's, but that's really interesting though. So yeah. think about it if you wanted to use this as for L'Oreal, right? Yep. They can isolate the bacteria and then use that in a, a cream or some sort of skincare and see if literally targeting around the eyes can make less wrinkles. Definitely. And how great would that be? Because it would be as natural as possible because you're dealing with naturally existing microbes. Yep. That is a fantastic study. Yeah. Listen, but now you have to I, use it and, and kind of apply it towards something, right? Exactly. No, it's not really and possible. again, what, I'm not trying to say that by putting more bacteria in your skin um, that you're going to look younger. I'm, I'm definitely not. But it does, you know, again, it begs the question that if you do that, could it help? We're already doing everything else, right? You're taking supplements. You're trying to stimulate collagen. Maybe you do some, uh, you know, med spa procedures or, or things like that or lasers or whatever. But if you have the appropriate microbiome, could it prevent the water loss? So we already know that if the hyaluronic acid is reduced, the skin becomes drier inherently, right? But if we can hang on to more of the water, we, we, it doesn't leak out of the skin as easily. And, so can you make helps. the argument, though, but can you make the argument, though, that, for example, acne-prone skin is due to a higher concentration of bacteria? It's so can this the wrong be? type of bacteria. Oh, so, okay. again, they isolated that in uh, younger skin. And, again, we're not talking propiobacteria. Propio sure, sure. That causes, acne. that causes that. You know, there is, uh, there is a specific... Uh, type of so type, and there are different forms of, st of staph epidermidis and and things like that that normally col colonize the skin. Very fun, very fascinating. But honestly. I'm just looking at it from a, a potential application using in you know skincare. So we're you know we could potentially create something that is a probiotic for the skin. That's really a great idea, and I can't wait to see what they're going to do with this. In the sense that are they going to use it causally to show that we can use this now to actually decrease uh, wrinkle formation. Yeah. Let's move along. There's another article here on Science Daily um, that I thought was kind of interesting. Um, New drug molecules could prevent skin aging caused by sun exposure. Mm -hmm. Well, wouldn't that be just something? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, a big, a big majority of, 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 of premature aging is caused by sunlight. And we see that not only does it cause wrinkles, but it really does cause sunspots and it just ruins the skin um, and causes skin cancer. Mm -hmm. So they basically looked at the two new mo molecules that generate minute amounts okay, of the gas hydrogen sulfide have been found to prevent skin from aging after being exposed to ultraviolet light that's found in sunlight. So obviously we know uh, that sunburns are a major cause of premature aging, right? But there's an international team that has made, I guess, major segues towards being able to reverse or delay this damage for really the first time ever. So University of Exeter Medical School um, in... Uh, Taiwan. In, where is this? Thailand. 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 Yeah. Um, it just basically shows that they, they did this for... They, they exposed adult human skin cells and the skin of mice to ultraviolet radiation, so UVA, and UVA is the part of natural sunlight which damages unprotected skin, right? And can penetrate through the through windows and, and even through some clothes. Um, that's why we say wear sunscreen even when you're wearing clothes. Mm -hmm. um, so and it causes premature aging. So what we've looked at, even with classic sun creams that people use, it helps, okay? But they don't penetrate it for long lasting. Mm, it doesn't go, preventing go long go lasting deep damage, yeah. right? So this research kind of paves the way by using two compounds invented at the University of Exeter, so AP39 and AP123, and these compounds did not protect the skin the same way that traditional sunscreens did, but instead penetrated the skin 
to correct how skin cells energy production and usage was turned off by UVA exposure. And this basically in turn then prevented the activation of skin degrading collagenous enzymes and some subsequent skin damage. So, so you have to understand it's a multifactorial way of why, how we get this damage or even get skin cancer. It's got to have, multiple things have to happen. That's why the second we go out in the sun, we don't get skin cancer. We don't get skin. So it, it takes time. So these compounds were, that have previously been shown to have impressive effects in reducing skin inflammation and skin damage after a burn or atopic dermatitis, which is like eczema, we, they, they tried to put this towards an anti-aging experiment, okay? This is the first time they've done that. And basically, long story short, it showed that, that it really did protect your skin from UV light. Now, what we need to do is take this and now apply it for a, a human trial, do a phase one trial and then do a phase two trial. But so far, so good. And, and if you can make it so this can not have you have premature skin cancer, if you forget about aging. I mean, if you can prevent skin cancer, this could be just a fantastic. fantastic well, you know, I think, what it's, do you think it's amazing. Um, okay. So the, the actual mechanism, you have to imagine UVA rays penetrate deeply, you know, you, I always think of it as UVB is burn and UVA is aging, but also can cause cancer. Right. So that inflammatory cascade, um, it essentially triggers collagenases uh, in the body. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's controlled by these mitochondria. So when the mitochondria run out of, uh, you know, when they're overpowered by uh, this stimulus, they create collagenases that ultimately eat up and break up down the skin. And that's right. why, you know, sun damaged skin is, is essentially... Uh, uh, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, these two compounds, it's so funny how everything goes back to mitochondria. I mean, it's cellular function. And again, I know I keep referencing Dr. Adil Khan, but we were talking about cellular dysfunction. And that is the key cause to aging everywhere in the body, every single organ. But the skin is not alone in that. The, the, you know, again, same thing applies here. And so ultimately, these two compounds... Uh, you know, will will we'll ultimately turn on the mitochondrial activity and actually prevent that inflammatory cascade from occurring. So, uh, again, we look uh, we look at these two compounds as a potential topical. So this could, you know, this type of research could potentially change the game in sunscreen. Oh, right? absolutely. So not only are oxybenzenes and things like that already, you know, yeah. they're banned in Europe. Yes. They've been in every uh, sunscreen for decades. So we're slowly moving away from that. Now we move over to, you know, zinc oxide, even titanium dioxide. Yeah, they're, they're trying to say you know, titanium is no good for you. Yeah, I, know. I mean, so the idea is we're, we're trying to come up with a way to naturally give your body the ability to protect itself from the sun. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I thought that this was such an impressive study. Um, and again, there's much more, uh, you know, there's much more research that needs to be done. But this is how it started. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, coming, they're just amazing ideas looking at mitochondrial activity, boosting that using a, health, uh, a hydrogen sulfur uh, sulfide ion. And, um, you know, we're protecting ourselves from the skin, at least from the sun, using this particular technology. So, I, again, I, I thought it was something that was uh, really, really cool. I think it's amazing. I, I think, I, honestly, if, if and I think that's what's going to end up happening because the, the amount of, of skin cancer we see and the amount of premature aging that we see, if we can actually target it, it would be great, you know. It, there's there's other things that are in in this world of research that I think is so fascinating, and that's like we talked to, to again back to Dio Khan is regenerative medicine is not just it's basically we're going to be growing or so to say limbs and and appendages and I mean there's a study here researchers produce graphs that replicate the human ear. 
Yeah. I mean, these are things that are really on the forefront and they're happening. I mean, one of our dear friends, uh, Dr. Kurt Satrulo, who's, who's the director of, of regenerative medicine at Cedar Sinai and the head of plastic surgery there right now. He's doing a lot of these very interesting kind of research for, on the forefront of how we can fix traumatic injuries with regenerative medicine, which would be, I mean, would be really amazing with 3D printers. Yep. Think about it. We're, we're there. We're almost there, guys, in the sense that 3D printers are, this article says that a 3D printer assembled the replica of an adult human ear. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Before you'd have to do microtia surgery, you'd have to take a rib and carve it out. And it looked okay, but it wasn't like push a button and print an ear and put it on. And even 3D printed skin closing wounds that contain hair follicles. Things that really, I mean, I think that the future is here um, and hopefully we can kind of once in a while bring you some of the latest and greatest in research that applies to whether it's skincare or it's plastic surgery or regenerative medicine because all of it's really exciting. Yeah, listen, this next study I'm very partial to, obviously, for two reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, And one deals with a surgeon, plastic surgeon researcher that we... uh, you know, have known for a long time and has done some amazing research. And two, uh, because plastic surgeons are, have been trying to hide or minimize scars for, you know, since the history of, of its inception. So this next study, um, this is out of Washington State University. Discovery enables adult skin to regenerate like a newborn's. Wow, I, now, just, I saw that. Wow. Okay, now we know Dr. Michael Longacre. Oh, and absolutely. We, he was the one, um, you know... And he and his partner, they did the first research on fetal, uh, on, on scarring. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they noticed that when they operated before a certain time in utero, um, uh, you know, on a fetus for life-threatening conditions or things like that, that they essentially did not scar when they were born. Mm-hmm. So we looked into all of the different ratios of collagen that uh, a fetus has versus an adult. And obviously they were completely different. And we thought that maybe there was a trigger that was turning these things on. So this study was near and dear to my heart. One, uh, because they were working off of that premise from from, uh, Dr. Longacre. So this is a newly identified genetic factor allows adult skin to repair itself like the skin of a newborn. The discovery has implications for wound treatment and preventing some of the aging process in skin. Researchers identified a factor in the skin of baby mice controlling hair follicle formation. When it was activated in adult mice, their skin was able to heal wounds without scarring. Wow. The reformed skin even included fur and could make goosebumps. Now, the important part about that is scars lose the ability to create uh, uh, goosebumps yep. and hair follicles. So, you know, again, this was in eLife. Uh, this was uh, published, and it's essentially a molecular switch that is said will control the formation of hair follicles as they develop during the first week of life. Okay, and so what they were actually able to do is use this genetic switch. They were comparing single cell RNA sequencing to compare the genes and cells in developing an adult skin and looking at the differences. And it's so amazing. I wonder if they use AI technology to help speed that process because there's billions of base pairs. They have to. Um, you know, part of the genetic code. But they, they identified it's called LEF1. And it's associated with papillary fibroblasts, which are developed, developed in cells in the papillary dermis. And that is the layer, you know, if we look at reticular and papillary dermis, that's the areas that we want to hit when we use laser technology, right. microneedling, and all kinds of things, because that's where the, we'll just say, quote, unquote, the important stuff happens. Absolutely. Right? And so, you know, they looked at Dr. Longacre's research and, uh, you know, now ultimately have uh, transformed that into this type of work. So using left one and other uh, factors uh, working to repair the skin. But they were able to use this to create injury, change the genetic code, and ultimately end up with a scarless area. So think of the implications. And you know, the reason why we use mice, one is because uh, they're ubiquitous and they have several different characteristics that are very similar to humans and that's they they react very similarly Mm -hmm. so 
Um, Especially the skin. Yep. I mean, that's like money right yep. there. And so the idea is we can use this and uh, extrapolate from that, that we have the potential. Now, we also have to find, uh, you know, this. so that is the mammalian gene. So now we locate that gene in a human and who knows, maybe this mini circle technology. This is what happens. You know, I love collaboration in science because what could potentially happen is this lab or someone at mini circle technology reads this paper, reaches out, does a collaboration on left one and finds a way to alter this segment or uh -huh. that creates a particular protein. Oh, great, you know, could you get a localized injection that could lead to scarlet surgery? I mean, it would be phenomenal. So that would be amazing. In any case, um, you know, I thought this is something that's really, really cool between, even with what you were saying, you know, 3D printing hair follicles and lab-grown skin or 3D printing a human ear, an adult ear. I mean, these are all potentials when it starts off at a cellular level or a genetic level and then at a cellular level and we see something happen in mammals the idea is that humans are pretty close behind. More amazing videos just like this one. Watch. The gist of it for people to understand is essentially making your immune system more tolerant, which means it can help to regulate things. So you're less likely to have hopefully autoimmune conditions